Okay, now I'm going to talk about the idea of tilting the cricoid for belting. And again, lots of you will have heard about belting, and you may even have read my book, and in my first edition of my book, uh, I had cricoid tilting for belting, and in the second edition of my book, I sort of said, well, we don't actually know how that happened, so it could be something else. It's moved on a bit since then. People often ask me about this in master classes, actually, because they've, you know, they've read my book, um, or maybe they've done their ESTIL courses, um, and they see that I don't use it when I'm teaching people to belt, and so, of course, the hand goes up. Why? Why aren't we doing it? Uh, well, the short answer is, uh, I don't do it because we can't do it. Okay? There are no muscles positioned in the larynx to pull the cricord downwards in that way, as Joe originally thought. I'll explain why uh, she may have thought that. Of course, if we had a cricosternoid muscle, for those of you who are used to thinking about muscles and attachments, we could do it. But we don't have one of those. So what I want to show you is that it's a fairly complicated diagram, but it gives an idea of a more likely scenario, given what is known about the intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of the larynx. And this um, diagram has been very kindly supplied by Tom Harris. And I did warn you, it's quite complicated. Tom uh, loves his vectors. And this is actually a summary of um, what is known currently about the, the muscles that hold the larynx in position, what we call the extrinsic muscles, and the intrinsic muscles that move the vocal folds, uh, and uh, the arytenoids, and that uh, also stretch the vocal folds in tilting. And this is derived from Vilkman et al, 1996, external laryngeal frame function, I think. OK, right. What I want you to notice, let's see if I can get this going again, is that red arrow at the top. So this is the thyrohyoid muscle and it attaches to the hyoid. Now the hyoid bone is actually very movable, but there are lots of muscle attachments to it that can hold it steady. And if you just look down here, Cricopharyngeus, uh, this is the muscle that is the bottom of the um, three, they're called the constrictors of the pharynx, sorry, they're called constrictors, that's what they do. Uh, we use them in swallowing. And there are two bands to that muscle, so you've got two arrows going in different directions, but the sum of the pull is that dotted line there. Okay, and this is a uh, tracheal pull, which is uh, to do with the link between the that there's a lining that comes up from your tra trachea, which the um, name has suddenly escaped me, which someone can shout out if they remember it, uh, which goes through the larynx. So if we can engage that thyrohyoid muscle, can you see where the thyroid cartilage would go? It would actually open up. So we've got a slightly up and back movement. Now, if we did that, it would allow us to shorten the vocal folds somewhat for belting, which is what Joe still suggested. And um, I actually don't disagree with that, because otherwise the sound wouldn't be as loud and as heavy as we hear. Uh, because normally when we do belting, it's above comfortable chest register. Okay, so we want to keep a relatively thick vocal fold in that action. And for those of us who teach a slight head tip up, and I'm not talking about chin forward or any of that stuff, I'm talking about nodding up. For those of us who did that, it makes even more sense that we would actually be able to keep a slightly thicker vocal fold. Okay. So, no, I'm not ready to go there. It's fair to ask what might Jo Estill have been seeing when she was looking down at belting, because she said that she saw the back of the cricoid. She could see the back of the arytenoids, and that was why she assumed that, let me get this right, that had happened. Okay? Fair enough. 
Well, actually, it's very easy to misinterpret what you see when you have an endoscopic view of the larynx. Endoscope, you know, little fiber optic thing that goes down the nose and looks down from above. I did some endoscopy in my own PhD, and I learned how easy it is to misinterpret. So remember, you're looking down at something that's actually positioned at an angle. It's on a slope. And when you see a structure like the arotenoids change position, it's very easy to make assumptions as to how that position was achieved, which muscles might be doing it. But since we know that a muscle on its own can only contract and relax, muscles don't stretch on their own, something else has to stretch them, it can only contract or relax in the same direction as its muscle fibers. So if I have a muscle that's going from there to there, it can only stretch in that direction. Does that make sense? So, bottom line for me is, I think we should stop talking about cricoid tilting for belting, because it's never a good idea to direct your student to do something physiological if it's not possible to do it. <laughs> okay? Some of us use metaphorical language and imagery, and some of, those, some of that imagery doesn't, doesn't make sense physiologically, but I don't think that matters. But if you're using a system of training that is supposed to be very married to physiology and that physiological movement can't happen, it needs to be reviewed. We're 25 years on. We can do this. <laughs>